What's going on, smart people? Today I am joined with a number of participants in the HUG Summer School program for nuclear physics grad students. Now I've made a number of videos sort of detailing what my research is and what I'm doing in grad school, but I mentioned in one of my most recent vlogs that up until I started this school, I really didn't know what else was out there in the world of nuclear physics. So I thought it would be a good idea for a video to get together with a lot of the participants in HUGS and learn about what they do and also answer some of the questions you all left in my community tab. So. I figured we'd have a bit of a discussion about each other's research interests and kind of just let the conversation steer towards, you know, whatever questions and comments we have about each other's research and overall experiences in nuclear physics. Okay, cool. So let's um let's go ahead and start off with like a show of hands. I want to get a feel for uh, who here is more of a theorist. One, two, three. Arun, you're not a theorist this whole time. Okay, that makes sense. I saw your uh, an honorary theorist. I thought I, it made no sense to me when you introduced your PhD advisor and he was an experimentalist, and I was like, that's so interesting how you're a theorist and you started out there. Okay, so we got three theorists. So then, uh, I guess, and who's experimental? Caleb, Jingyi, and Arun. Cool. So it seems like we're actually pretty, uh, pretty diverse in that respect. So. I guess we can just start off with everyone kind of introducing themselves and giving me an elevator pitch of what your research interests are. And, um, you know, throughout this, we'll just ask questions and make comments uh, throughout this video, okay? So actually the first person on my screen is Jingyi. Jingyi, you wanna tell us a little bit about yourself, your research, those kinds of interests? Okay. Yeah, um, so my name is Jingyi Hyo. I'm the rising fourth year grad student from Duke University. So uh, my physics experiment is the elastic quantum scattering of helium-3 at Higgs uh, facility located at the Triangle University Nuclear Laboratory. And uh, the goal of this experiment is to extract the neutron polarizabilities. And the neutron polarizability uh, is a very fundamental quantity that describe the response of the charge constituents inside the nucleon uh, to the external electromagnetic field. So uh, this is this quantity is tightly related to the internal structure of the nucleon. And uh, but I haven't uh, finished running this experiment, and uh, this experiment is going to run uh, hopefully in this fall due to the impact of the COVID nineteen. <laughs> yeah, and. I am also working on the PRAT2 and DRAT experiments at JLab. And PRAT2 is uh, an approved experiment, uh, which is uh, the goal of it is to measure the proton charge radius and uh, trying to resolve the proton charge radius puzzle. And uh, the DRAT experiment is um, trying to measure the deuteron charge radius, um, which is very similar to the proton charge radius. Awesome. Um, so sorry yeah. to cut you off. So I think that there's a few questions in the in the comment section later that we're asking about proton radius and maybe it was the charge radius. I'm not sure. Uh, can I ask why why helium? So um, because my goal is to measure the neutron uh, polarizabilities, and for helium three, actually this is a very unique uh, nuclei uh, for us to extract the. Neutron, because uh, as you know that inside helium three there are two proton and one neutron. So if uh, we have a polarized helium three target, actually it is served as an effective neutron target. The reason why we use a helium three is because uh, first of all uh, nobody has done an experiment uh, using a helium three due to a series of uh, technical uh, difficulties because uh, in the end we want to, uh, we have to use uh, the effect field theory to extract the neutron uh, polarizabilities. Hmm. But I guess you leave that part to the to the theorists then, right? The, doing the actual calculation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. And also, right. yeah, I also want to mention that it is much more difficult for us to extract the neutron polarizability compared to the proton uh, polarizability. Because for proton, uh, we can use the hydrogen target easily. But for neutron, uh, as what I said, we have to use some effective uh, new neutron uh, target. So that's, that is one of the difficulties. And that's because you can't just have a, a collection of neutrons, right? They'll decay? 
Yeah, we don't have stable neutron target because uh, the decay time of neutron is 15 minutes, right? Gotcha. I see. I've never heard of the proton charge radius puzzle. Could you give me one sentence summary of that? Oh, sure. Uh, maybe I can. So um, actually, the proton charge radius puzzle is uh, something. So ge in general, there are two different kinds of experiments to measure the proton charge radius. Uh, one is using the spectroscopy technique, and the other is uh, EP elastic scattering. So around um, 2010. Um, so you can see that actually uh, there are two different kinds of um, proton charge radius values. So one major kind or uh, one major value is measured by the ordinary uh, hydrogen spectroscopy and the EP elastic scattering. So they support a larger uh, proton charge radius value. Uh, however, um, in 2010 and 2013, uh, the high precision um, muonic hydrogen spectroscopy give a relatively smaller uh, proton charge radius, which arouses uh, the proton charge radius puzzle. So, uh, so the PRED2 experiment, now we are trying to uh, resolve such uh, the discrepancy between the two EP elastic scattering problem. Okay. Uh, so I guess next we can go to, uh, let's do Philip. You want to tell us a little bit uh, about yes. your research? Yeah, happy to. My name is Phil. I'm a grad student at CUNY, the UCT University of New York. Uh, I'm a theorist and I work on what's called the color gloss condensate. So very briefly to explain what that means. Uh, sort of historically, our view of the, of the nucleus of atoms has changed quite a lot. So a lot of us learn in like high school or early college that what you have are uh, protons and neutrons that sit together in this like dense little ball of a nucleus at the center of an atom. But what we've learned more recently is that these protons and neutrons are actually made up of even smaller things that we call quarks. And these quarks are bound together by another particle called the gluon, right? This name because it glues them together. Um, so now our view of the nucleus has changed a bit. Now, nowadays, we think of it more as a distribution of quarks and gluons. And there's been a lot of progress on figuring out exactly what that distribution is. But for my taste, what we do is we try to look at some general properties that we'll find in uh, scattering experiments of this distribution. So one of the things that we know will happen if you take this nucleus, this distribution of quarks and gluons, and accelerate it down the beam line at close to the speed of light, we know from Einstein that this distribution will first become length contracted. So it'll be like a pancake. Uh, and secondly, we also know that the time scale of the interactions within that nucleus will also become dilated. So what that means is that on short time scales, it can be treated as frozen. Another thing that we need is the fact that uh, as you accelerate a nucleus up close to the speed of light, the number of gluons inside increases drastically to a point where we say that the nucleus is saturated with gluons. So this object, this frozen pancake uh, of saturated gluons traveling down the beam line, that's what we call a color glass condensate. And what, what that means mathematically is that you can treat that target as a classical background. So what I do then is try to figure out what kind of predictions can we make from say an incoming electron scattering off that color glass condensate. So this idea has been around for a while and what I'm doing is calculating corrections in this model. So what I'm doing is calculating the next to leading order corrections uh, to the scattering of an electron off a color glass condensate producing a pair of hadrons in the final state um, using this color glass condensate formalism, which really is an effective theory of QCD. That's, that's interesting. I thought, so if you're scattering off of this gluon mess, I thought that uh, gluons didn't interact directly with the photons. So how do you scatter an electron off of a gluon? That's an excellent question. So what that you're right that the uh, the photon itself will not see that mass of gluons. So what can happen is that the photon will split into a dipole, right, a quark antiquark pair, mm -hmm. and those quarks and antiquarks will then interact with the target. So what that means is that all of these uh, processes. Uh, they include an electromagnetic piece, that initial splitting of the photon into a quark-antiquark pair, 
But after that, those quarks will be interacting a bunch of times with the target as they travel through the target. Yeah, great question. <laughs> Do we want to move on to maybe, I think I'm going to alternate between theory and experiment that way. It doesn't get too saturated. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just a quick question. Is it uh, next leading order gym walk or BK or what are you doing? Yeah, so what we're doing right now is, so a lot of those uh, evolution equations were derived for proton nucleus collisions. And since what we're doing is deep in elastic scattering, it's probably gonna be exactly the same, but we hope to find something similar to gem walk for the Wilson line correlators and similar other evolution equations for you know your um, uh, fragmentation functions and proton distribution functions. Uh, we expect to find similar things, but there may be some interesting differences to take account of as well. It's cool. going to be interesting to edit this and just see how much jargon <laughs> actually makes it in. Yeah, Sorry, it's a that one was just for me. Right. I mean, that uh, just for fun, the J in Gemwalk, that's my advisor. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah? Oh, nice. The, mm -hmm. the W in Gemwalk was my previous advisor. Oh, okay. Exciting. Yeah, great. <laughs> All right, Caleb, I think it's your turn. You want to, what, what do you, I know you're experimental. What's, uh, if I had to guess, I think that you probably do work with scintillators a lot. Just based off yes, of like I, what's in J or what's at ODU. Um, yes, I, I, I do. Um, I was working on band in fact, but my current research and what will be my thesis is actually on pion production cross sections for both inclusive and semi-inclusive scattering experiments in Jefferson Labs Hall B. So in these experiments, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, of course, measure the pion production cross-section. And we want that because we want to be able to compare that information to an event generator called eGenie, which is an electron event generator that's basically um, a mode of a neutrino event generator called Genie. So in, G in um, neutrino experiments, it's very difficult to measure, uh, to take measurements for various reasons. So to supplement them, we have neutrino event generators. But the theories that are behind Genie have very high uncertainties. So what we're doing is we have uh, the electron event generator to test aspects of Genie. And then you will compare that to information from different experiments. And so in my case, I'll be doing time production cross sections. So do, do you have something that you want to further extract or you just want to measure the cross section and compare to the generator? You just want to measure the cross section compared to the generator. I have a, a general question, I guess, for experimental grad students. So as you mentioned, um, actually both of you already, um, that you, need to first set up the experiment. There's a lot of planning to that. And then there's some runtime and data analysis in the end. So there's a quite broad range of time, um, but the grad student time is a limited amount of time. So I was wondering which piece of that project you are interested in. Is it more than towards the end of data analysis or are you there in the setup of the experiment? What, what exactly will you do there? I'm basically data analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, actually, I was I helped build band, um, which was before the data taking, which um, is where I'm getting my information for measuring the pion production cross section. So, I've kind of been through the whole process. You build a detector, you then set it up in the hall, and then you take data. Although now I'm not taking data with band because it's not necessary for pion production cross section, but I'm now going to be analyzing data. Yeah, I am more on data analysis also. Typically, advisors tend to give you a flavor of several different aspects of experimental physics, which is data analysis, hardware and construction, then sitting on shifts and taking uh, data, data acquisition. Right. So, so you got a little bit of everything. Yeah, typically, I mean, depending on, it's a good understanding between advisors that uh, to, depending on where and when the graduate graduate student joins that that particular experiment, um, they try to get data from an older experiment that was conducted that hasn't been analyzed yet, so that the students can get a flavor of how it's like to witness results coming out from a data analysis. Oh, I was going to ask Caleb if he's looking at 
charged pion cross sections or neutral pion cross sections? Charged. Neutral would be very difficult. For the next hour, threat? we're going to talk about the differences between charged pion production and neutral. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we recently proposed an experiment uh, in RA, and I can talk a little bit about uh, that when my turn comes. Hopefully it's last, so I have the rest of the evening to describe that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we have not measured these pion cross-sections for 6.6 GV electron beam period, and it's uncharted territory, so your data could be very useful to um, yeah, your data data could be very useful to new experiments where the background hasn't hasn't been measured yet. Can I ask a general, a more general question? So, with with measuring all of these cross sections, for, so for people who are watching who aren't familiar with the term, the cross section, you're literally counting events. You're counting how many times maybe a certain particle with a certain range of energy or that's scattered into a certain angle is detected. What kind of information can you extract from that kind of measurement in general? Right. Um, that's a beautiful question. Um, the cross-section depends on the interaction mechanism between the probe and the particle. So essentially what you're carrying away is how they interacted with each other. That's what we want to know more about. Well, that's, that's a great explanation. Um, so uh, unless there are other questions, Astrid, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do? Yes, yeah, sure. So, hello, I'm Astrid, and I'm a theory postdoc at Jefferson Lab. However, um, I'm getting closer and closer to, to working with experimentalists, or no, I am working with experimentalists a lot, and uh, over the years, uh, always more. So, it is very important for me to actually be doing theory that is directly useful for experiments that are ongoing now, and also many of the projects that I have are also analysis of uh, experimental data that just came out from Jefferson Lab, for example. So we're in constant communication, and that's important for me personally to have this attachment to, let's say, reality, as opposed to doing the real formal theoretical calculations where you don't really have experiments that can uh, search for those things at the same time. And there are two main uh, focuses of interest that I have. So one of them going in the direction of what most people do here also because it's Jefferson Lab, uh, the structure of the proton. So in particular, um, while we know that the very high energy collisions of electrons, for example, scattering of protons, we have a rather smooth behavior of the cross sections. When we go to the lower energy regime, that's where the whole resonance excitation happens. So suddenly in your cross section, we have a whole mess of resonances appearing and peaks and so on. And that's the, the region that I'm most interested in describing in order to get a better grasp of, of what the proton structure is made of when looking also in, into these resonance excitations. So that will give us insight about the, the quark content and how they interact, because apparently it, in this lower energy regime, they interact in a very non-trivial way. And uh, the second main focus that I have is also the exotic hadrons. So most of the hadrons that we know from our day-to-day -day life, if I can say that when talking about particle physics, um, are clustered either in, in hadrons such as protons, so having three quarks, or uh, in mesons like pions that have a quark and an antiquark. But now we know already that there are also some that we call exotic that don't fulfill this, this nice picture of either two or three quarks. And suddenly you can have things like uh, five quarks appearing or four quarks. So you have a bit more uh, strange uh, uh, hadrons appearing uh, that you excite at, at some energies. And this is what I'm also looking into. So there's some program looking for that also at Jefferson Lab and many experiments over the world that are intensely looking for these exotic states and for one, um, I work on giving theoretical predictions of where they should be, and at the same time, uh, when getting experimental data, I try to analyze it and to see um, what kind of exotic this is. Interesting. Hmm. I gotta sync up the audio again. <laughs> okay. 
I thought you were clapping because Astrid gave an excellent explanation. <laughs> yeah, this, this this clap is totally not to sync up the audio. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, with your with your calculations, you, you mentioned uh, lower energy regions. So I assume the stuff that you do is non perturbative. It's non perturbative exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. does that mean you're? So, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say that uh, since we were talking about the forces, so the, the strong force is usually described by the quantum chromodynamics theory, and there is one region that is very well tackled, let's say, using perturbative QCD, so there, there's just a natural expansion of how to describe it in calculations, and we know that uh, although it's a very difficult theory to really formally describe, we can make approximations that we have very well under control, and we know how good those approximations are, we know that we approximate it up to 90% or 95%. While in the low energy regime, um, the approximations go haywire, so we don't really have that much control of um, how to, how much we have to take into account. And what we're in the direction we're also going is uh, using tools of machine learning, but that at the moment is more for the explorative uh, studies. So we're now bringing machine learning uh, and artificial intelligence up to speed to be able to be as good as the models that we had so far. Uh, at the moment, they're not better yet. So they can be quicker, but at the moment they're still in the development process. So uh, the, the models developed by humans are still uh, the, the most up-to-date, the most advanced ones. Awesome. This is really interesting. Like, it, it's it's fascinating that no one said GPD once and that's what I went into this program thinking everyone's research was just yeah I'm trying to extract information about this generalized part on distribution but no there's there's so much out there so I think um, in the in the interest of keeping it theory experiment theory experiment I believe it's Arun's turn to oh, tell us man. we can defer it to <laughs> Daniel if, if people if people you want to you want to go last sure um, but I do want to say one thing. Astrid, I really like what you said about theory and experiment going hand in hand. I believe, I truly believe that because um, for experiments, you can't just go and say, okay, I want to see what happens if I start measuring this. It's not really how you get approved of doing that experiment. One has to really understand the theory behind it and say, okay, this is the point where we can actually test something and then go uh, ask the physics advisory committee if we can make such kind of a measure. Um, and same with theory, right? You, you, one of the famous uh, theorists, uh, Richard Feynman, uh, he's in inspiration series. Uh, but he said that uh, any theory has to, it ultimately has to agree with experimental data, right? And so there's always this I know in the community there's a little bit of like, oh theory, oh experiment, come on. I mean, but I'm one of those who believe that there has to be, they have to go hand in hand, and, and I, I try my best to hang out with theorists. Absolutely, that's why we work at Jefferson Lab, where you really have both departments in one, and that's really nice. You really also notice how efficient it then becomes because the communication is just quick. Both are there. There's yeah. no lag in between. So. Yeah, I really like the synergy we have at Jefferson Lab with theory and experiment. Yeah, and I think I mean this whole idea that uh, you know there's too much divide between theory and experiment that has sort of come. You know, people have really sort of tried to get around that by sort of inventing this new word, right? Phenomenology. <laughs> so there's a lot of people that what they're really doing is phenomenology, not theory. So my work, because it's directly tied to. Uh, experiments that are going to be accessible at the electron ion collider when that's finished. Uh, so what I do is technically falls under the, the branch of phenomenology, not pure theory. Uh, so yeah, oh, I so definitely think stealing my pitch. Really going... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll, I'll shut up now. So would you say your research is phenomenal? <laughs> that remains to be seen. Come to a conference and watch me talk and then you tell me. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that we went over that topic. That was a good point. Uh, Daniel, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you're doing? So I think we got a little bit of a spoiler that it's it's also phenomenal research. So, but I'll let you. <laughs> sure. So I'm Daniel. I'm a PhD student at Ohio State University. 
And I basically work on what is called the proton spin puzzle. So we know that the proton has spin a half, where spin is the inherent angular momentum of the particle at rest. But as Philip mentioned uh, very eloquently, the proton isn't a fundamental particle. It's made up of smaller things. It's got quarks and gluons, and all of these particles have their own inherent angular momentum, their own spin, but also they can move around each other, so they have their own orbital angular momentum. So the proton spin puzzle basically asks, how does all of this angular momentum come together uh, to be a spin a half? Um, you might expect, okay, the proton is just two up quarks and down quarks, that you can just add you know, two spin ups and a spin down, uh, but existing measurements of the quark contribution to the spin only add up to about 30% of the total spin. So basically, it's a mystery as to what is the full extent of each of these distributions and how do they add up together. So in particular, what I do, uh, I look at just the quark contribution, the contribution to the spin of the proton from the spin of the quarks. So existing experiments can only measure a finite amount of this spin. And it turns out that you can never actually just measure this entire distribution with existing experiments, because in order to calculate the total spin contribution, you need to actually do experiments at infinite energy. So what we need is theory that we can trust to describe this distribution for us. So my advisor and his former student came up with a theory to describe this, saying, given some initial condition for this quark spin, we can predict the future quark spin. So where I come in is I've taken this theory and I've basically programmed it up and using the help of some collaborators at Jefferson Lab, we thrown our code at your computers and then spent a million computing hours uh, trying to fit existing data to find what is this initial condition and then we use our theory to make a prediction at higher energies. I have a quick question as well. You mentioned that the quark distribution, sorry, the quark spin contribution uh, to the spin of the proton is about 33%. Is that number fixed or does that change depending on the energy scale at which you probe the proton? In order to calculate the total spin contribution, you need to integrate over all the and X, which means mm. you need oh, to see. probe the distribution at all energies. So when I say 33%, that's like we've measured down to a Bjorken X of like 0.1 from 1 to 0.1. I see. Okay. So it's an integrated distribution. Okay. That, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. All right. Yeah. And because we can't probe at infinite energies, right. we need some theory to say, okay, what does it actually look like at small x? And then we yeah. use so do you spin put some like a, to add things together. Do you put a cutoff by hand and just say beyond here, it's too small, it's not going to contribute? Or how do you do it? So the point of our theory is that we are trying to push it as low as possible. Okay. So yeah. we actually have trouble describing the large x stuff because our theory is small x theory. If x is too right. big, we can't actually fit the data. Um, so in principle, we extend down as far as we want. And then actually, your research comes in, because saturation yeah, right. is supposed to kick in and do something to these distributions at some point. Right. Yeah. Exciting. All right. I think it's time. Or no pressure. <laughs> All eyes on you now. We know We know you wanted to oh, save, do we save need for to last. Class? Yeah, we got to do okay. the sync the audio. <laughs> Can we do it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was a joke earlier when I said that I could go last so I could have the rest of the evening. But uh, <laughs> hopefully I can have uh, the rest of the evening to describe what I do. Um, hello, my name is Arun. I'm a postdoc at Jefferson Lab. I work in two different halls, um, Hall A and Hall C. Um, I've been involved in a couple of different projects. Um, uh, first, I, I uh, joined um, an experiment in Hall C. Uh, it's based off of nucleon spin puzzle, uh, as uh, Daniel described. Um, it's particularly looking at this orbital angular moment of contribution for the valence quarks, and that's what Hall C is really good at doing. Um, so that's one of the experiments that I've joined. Then after uh, supporting that experiment, I moved on to another experiment in Hall A, and uh, that's where we study these form factors. Um, the nucleon form factors are basically giving you um, a rough uh, understanding of how the charge and magnetization is distributed inside this proton while this proton is still intact, or the nucleon is still intact. So people have done this for the proton, 
they're still doing it for the neutron and they're trying to extend it for higher and higher energies to see how this, this, this behavior changes as a function of the probed energy of Q squared. Um, then I also study uh, pion structure. And this pion structure is, you know, pion is, uh, as you have heard, it's a bread and butter of a nuclear physicist, right? And we really, it's a two quark system. We think we know it really well, but we don't. Okay, so, um, so there's one more experiment that is aimed at doing this, um, studying the pion structure. Um, this interest in nuclear physics in general has developed over time. It wasn't like I got up one day and I said, I am going to do this particular project. And this is where I belong. Uh, but it uh, started off by a series of why questions. And when I was an undergrad, I had a really good mentor who gave me uh, good advice and then uh, brought me into the world of nuclear physics and slowly started asking uh, a series of why questions and that's uh, what okay cool uh i think i want to just ask some general questions to all of you because I'm, I'm curious so there's a lot of differences in research and i'm curious back when you were in undergrad comparing when you were an undergrad you made the decision that you want to pursue this this research professionally uh how much overlap is there with what you expected your research to entail with what you're doing now that's a really good question. So the advice that I give to people who ask me, like, you know, how do I know what to, what topic to pick, that sort of thing, my advice to people is, as an undergrad, just try as many things as you can get your hands on. So for instance, now, of course, I'm a sort of particles, nuclear physics Hello? theory guy. Uh, but can back in undergrad, me? I did. Yes. Okay. I was disconnected. Oh, OK. Oh. So, but yeah. back in undergrad, I did uh, I did some experimental work in a condensed matter lab. Uh, I did actually a little bit of nuclear theory work, but it wasn't anything like what I do now. Uh, and I also did some a very quick project on some of the wackier ideas in uh, in string theory. And so, you know, having all these different experiences helps you to make an informed decision going forward, as opposed to you know just saying, well, that sounds fun. I guess I'll try that. So, my advice to people is just try as much as you can and. With that knowledge, you'll then know how to make an informed decision going forwards. Can I follow up on that? So when Philip says try as much as you can, literally in undergrad, you can go to professors' doors, knock on them, and say, "Hey, I don't know what you do. Can you tell me about it? Is there a project I can maybe do over the summer or even during the semester? Or are there internships around? Like, just ask for things, and you will be surprised how accommodating professors are to that sort right. of thing." By the way, um, just so that everyone knows, so I'm, pr I'm almost definitely going to cook this video down and, and cut stuff out and, and things like that just to make it a little bit more uh, on the concise side. So by, I don't want anyone to feel like they're, you know, I want you to speak what's on your mind and stuff. Uh, and, and just afterwards, I'm going to kind of nitpick through and just take some stuff out. And So I hope no one minds if I do that. No, not at all. I mean, look, you're you're the expert at this. So you know <laughs> what uh, what your viewers will gain the most out of. So for sure, cut out you know cut out anything that you don't think is uh, is as useful for them. And knowing I that think... actually removes the pressure of trying to condense everything we say into one third of the time that we actually want to say it. Yeah, you will do that for us. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing that would probably make us feel bad is if we started expressing our opinion and I say. See, what I think is, <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, the audio is just cut off right there. <laughs> Man. Okay, now I really know what you think. <laughs> right, it's probably not a good idea to cut off our audio and replace it with, you know, flat earth or something. Yeah, just do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, Jingye, I, I cut you off. Um, so with your experience, it's fascinating that yeah, it's how, how the experimental stuff leads into grad school, because with the theory, you can kind of pick it up anywhere. But with grad school, you kind of have to be on site somewhere. So can you can you talk about your experience with that? Yeah, so um, I did my undergrad in China. And so in my undergrad, I actually um, did, uh, did two different majors. Um, my first major is actually engineering mechanics. and physics is my second major. So at that time, so uh, I also tried um, different things. Um, 
I did some research uh, in engineering and some research in physics. And at that time, actually, um, so my current advisor is recommended uh, by undergrad advisor. And I chose my undergrad advisor because I feel like um, he was a pretty interesting person and I really like to work with him. I think, uh, yeah, having a good relationship with your advisor is, I think, one of the most important things. Right. I definitely know friends who, you know, they, they found a research topic they loved, but they were like, yeah, it's fine. The advisor and I don't really get along. It's no big deal until it ends up being a big deal. Yeah. So I, I have a lot of questions, but I just know that a lot of these are probably going to be asked during the during the comments or, or you know, what I'm, it'll it'll bring up uh, a light bulb will go off when someone asks a question and it spider webs from there into, into various topics. So I think I do want to save some of the questions I have for, for that video. Um, so, so Andrew, you didn't you didn't get to tell us about your research. Oh, they've they've heard about my research a million times. I, I, we can talk about it. Do uh, you want to hear that? Look, look, just watch Andrew's videos. You will exactly. learn all you need. About <laughs> no, this 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 video is about y'all. I mean, we can we can talk afterwards for a little bit more, but uh, about that stuff. But I just I really wanted to know more, and I think the people watching would like to know more about what you all are doing, which you explained beautifully, by the way. Um, so yeah, I think I will actually end this video here. Uh, and in the next one, we're going to be answering some of the questions that you all have put in the community tab, which I'm really excited for. I, I cheated a little bit and looked at some of them so that I'm not, you know, completely just at a loss for words and have no idea. Some of them are kind of tough questions, I'll, I'll be honest. But uh, but yeah, I'm looking forward to, to going through that with all of you. And I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to speak with me and tell me, you know, what is what else is on this bleeding edge of, of nuclear physics. So, Thank you so much for your time today. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Right. Thanks for having us. You're welcome. Thank you, yeah. All right. And I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know in the comments section if you did, and I'll see you guys there. That's just for the formal <laughs> ending of this. <laughs> well, yeah. I, don't, I don't see the comment section here in Gathertown. What are you talking about, Andrew? 